Hey guys, welcome back to yet another video here on Rev Atlas. I'm Sandeep and in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the camera review of the Poco X2 smartphone. Now, before we get started, please do make sure that you give us a thumbs up at the end of the video if you happen to enjoy it. Also hit the subscribe button and also turn on notifications to avoid missing any videos from us in the future. Now, let's get this video started. The POCO X2 is equipped with a primary 64MP Sony IMX686 sensor and is the first smartphone in India to come with it. It's a tad bit larger in terms of the sensor size at 1.17 inches compared to 1x1.72 1 inch 64MP Samsung GW1 sensor. The aperture is f1.9 and you get 0.8 micron pixel size which comes to 1.6 micron with pixel binning. Additionally, you get an 8MP f2.2 ultra wide angle camera with 1 4th inch sensor size and 1.12 micron pixel size, a 2MP macro camera, and a 2MP depth sensor as well. The shots from the X2 are very natural when it comes to the processing and the color palette, but if you require any extra saturation or some pop to your images, you can turn on the AI mode, but I personally prefer to leave it off and make these adjustments myself in post production. However, for the layman, the changes that the AI mode makes will definitely save him or her the hassle of having to do it themselves. Dynamic range is good, and even in harsh and heavy sunlight, it does well. We recommend leaving the HDR mode turned on always, and should you require extra dynamic range, the night mode also comes in handy even during well-lit conditions, although it does have a tendency of darkening the overall frame. There's plenty of detail to work with, although it does seem to exhibit signs of watercolor-like effect particularly when there's a lot of greenery or foliage around. Hopefully these can be ironed out with software updates, and in such situations the sharpness does take a hit and details can seem a bit blotchy. Focus is quick and shutter speed is fast as well, and white balance is always on point and the exposure metering is done well too. By default, the X2 shoots pixel bin images with 16 megapixels of resolution with 1.6 micron pixel size. But you can also capture in full 64 megapixel resolution with 0.8 micron pixel size, and doing so will give you file sizes that are around 3 times the size of the 16 megapixel ones. But doing so doesn't really give any major benefits. Because despite the larger size, there's better resolved detail and sharpness on the pixel bin images by a slight margin. But you should also be aware that shooting in 64 megapixel means that you won't get the HDR mode, which does affect highlights in particular, like in this scene. The 64 megapixel mode also tends to use a slower shutter speed and as a result makes it more prone to shakes. So it would be ideally used on a tripod or a steady surface. There's raw capture even with the default camera app and you can access this by heading over to the pro mode and toggling it in the more options menu. You get large DNG files upwards of 30 MB and photography enthusiasts would love to capture in raw as it offers great flexibility and a lot of room to play with in post processing. Shutter speed goes all the way up to 32 seconds for the primary camera, half second for the ultra wide angle camera and one fourth second for the macro camera. Funnily enough, the fastest shutter speed option available for any camera is 1 by thousandth of a second and it's weird because in auto mode, especially in really bright conditions, we have seen the EXIF information pointing to a shutter speed upwards of 1 by six thousandth of a second and we would have loved to have that option to select manually in the pro mode. Hopefully Poco decides to implement this in future updates. Coming to the portrait mode, we love the fact that the blurring is linear and not just based on the edge detection of a subject or object. Take this photo for example, it's 19 MB in terms of size and you can see how much detail it manages to capture by zooming in. But most importantly, notice how the dog's face is in focus and how the blur gradually increases based on how much further it is away from the camera. But also pay attention to the ground below the dog's face. This isn't blurred. On most phones, the dog in his entirety will be in focus and the rest of the image would be blurred. But here it takes into account the depth and maps the blur accordingly and it's very impressive to be honest and it even works in terms of blurring the foreground where you are too close to the camera while this point of focus is actually further away. While the depth mapping is excellent, there are tiny flaws in edge detection at times like the dog's nose in this photo but that's only really tangible when pixel peeping and updates should help minimize that as well. One thing I really loved was the cinema mode that is there in portrait mode. It basically captures 21 is 9 aspect ratio images that look stunning when you get the framing right. 
Like the regular portrait mode, you can adjust the depth effect in this as well, all the way from f1 to f16. The images are captured in 16.2 is to 9 aspect ratio and are letterboxed to create this effect. So you'd have to crop the black bars at the top and bottom to get the true 21 is to 9 aspect ratio. You can also shoot 20 is to 9 wide aspect ratio images without using the cinema mode by just enabling the full screen aspect ratio for image capturing. Low light performance is good but nothing out of the ordinary and you should be using the night mode in such situations as you get better exposure, better contrast and higher levels of perceived sharpness and detail especially with added clarity. It also does reduce the noise but the sharpness and detail aren't too great in extreme low light situations as the aggressive noise reduction smoothens it out. If and when possible we recommend using the pro mode and manually exposing for a longer duration to get the best possible result as you can see the difference is huge. One of the biggest benefits and differences that we saw compared to the Samsung GW1 64MP sensor was the lack of hot pixels. When exposing that sensor for long duration, you're faced with a lot of white dots splattered across the frame and this is due to the sensor overheating. The IMX 686 doesn't have this issue even at 32 seconds of exposure, while over 10 seconds itself you started seeing the results on GW1 powered phones. The other option is to use Gcam or Google camera which we shall talk about later on in the video. Ultra wide angle camera manages to capture a more dramatic field of view compared to the regular camera and you'll see a difference in terms of quality, detail and sharpness but that is expected and holds true for practically every phone out there. Poco has minimized the difference though between the regular and ultra wide in terms of the color output and overall treatment and is fixed focus by the way so don't expect to get too close to the action. The low light performance is very poor especially when you consider the sensor size and there's no night mode for it either so you're better off using the regular camera in low light. If you do want to get closer to the action you can make use of the 2 megapixel macro camera and I know 2 megapixel isn't much but it's much better than the macro cameras that we have seen on realme devices both in terms of image quality as well as the minimum focusing distance. This also has autofocus which is good but it takes a while to lock focus and a pro tip is that if you're taking macro of objects or subjects that are moving then use the pro mode and set a fast shutter speed to minimize the blurring and you can also manually adjust the focus in pro mode in case you aren't able to lock focus by tapping. You wouldn't be using the macro too often but perhaps it's definitely good to have when you need it. At the front you get a 20 megapixel f2.2 camera and a secondary 2 megapixel depth sensor. The front facing camera images are good in terms of the dynamic range and colors and it annoyingly always enables the beauty mode by default and you have to manually deselect it every single time. Not sure if this is an issue with our unit or maybe something that a software update can help fix but it's definitely annoying at this point. However that said I might be part of a minority who doesn't prefer to have beautify on for selfies so maybe it's not an issue for all. There's plenty of detail and a lot of sharpness although at times it may seem to be too over sharpened as well. Portrait mode is good in terms of the blurring, but in terms of edge detection it needs to be worked upon, particularly when it comes to areas around the ear. You get the same cinema mode for selfies here too, but it's not as useful here as it is with the rare camera. You also get access to various lighting modes and you can adjust the aperture effects before or after capturing the photo. You can record videos with all three cameras at the back, except for the depth sensor as it is obvious. Let's start with the primary camera. Options include 1080p and 4K 30fps modes with EIS, while you can also do 1080p 60 without EIS. Stabilization is excellent in the 30fps modes that support EIS and you'd be forgiven for thinking that they were taken on a gimbal. We recommend capturing in 4K 30fps as you get twice the bitrate with better sharpness and detail while still getting stable footage. The 1080p 60fps mode is a bit too shaky so we recommend using it only with a gimbal or tripod but we found that it looks more natural compared to the other modes. The 4K and 1080p 30fps modes have some extra saturation and contrast added to it which we wish weren't there. You can also shoot the same modes with 2x magnification but the resulting videos are softer and also vary in terms of bitrate. Still the loss of detail isn't as bad as a 2x zoom might imply so it can come in handy especially since they still have EIS. The autofocus seems to have been improved and there is no longer focus hunting or at least not as much as there was before on Xiaomi and Poco phones but they also have a new mode which allows focus tracking by simply selecting the subject or object and it does a good job at keeping the focus in check. You can also capture videos with the ultra wide angle camera in 1080p 30fps without EIS and we wish that it had EIS as well since it would have allowed for better continuity especially for folks who intend to use these shots together in a vlog for example. 
The front facing camera video has good quality and detail and good colors but the lack of EIS plays spoiled sport and gives results that could have been better. Audio quality is good though. Hey guys, this is Sandeep from Revetless and in this video we're taking a look at the front facing camera of the POCO X2 capturing 1080p video at 30fps. Let me know what you guys think about the overall sharpness, the dynamic range, how well it's picking up my voice in this particular scenario and the stabilization as well. Slow motion videos record at 720p regardless of whether you're shooting at 120fps, 240fps or 960fps. The first two allow continuous recording, while 960fps only allows a quick capture and stops when the buffer is full. The phone supports Camera 2 API out of the box and we got Gcam running on it and the results are ex expected and better than the stock camera ones. Here are some comparison shots, but please do make sure to check out our Google camera review for full fledged samples and analysis in detail. Therefore, the POCO X2 is perhaps the best camera phone under Rs 20,000 currently, especially when it comes to the photos. In terms of videos, it could be better and we hope that software updates would help tweaking it. Gcam only improves the photos further, so we'll be doing a Google camera review as well. But currently, if you're looking for a great camera phone, particularly in terms of photos, under 20k rupees, the POCO X2 is the one to watch out for. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. See you again in the next one.